welcome to the service today. We pray that you have had an encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ, that in some way this week you have met with him. Our call to worship this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 12. It says this, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. The beginning of the lockdown, we at Northfield were discussing what are we going to do in the season. And the answer that we received and that we've shared with each other is this. We've decided that we will do whatever we can to the best of our ability for as long as we possibly can. And that reminds me of this opening passage, our call to worship where Paul writes and he says, be joyful in hope. And I wonder what has this week been for you? Have there been moments of hope? And have those moments of hope led to joy? Have they led to the joy and the wonder of what it will be like when we can gather again? May this week, may you and I, may we find a source of joy in the weeks to come. I wonder about your level of patience in this time of affliction. I know for me there have been times where I have been patient and times where I definitely have not. And then finally, I think of the call to be faithful in prayer. May this be a season where we learn to connect with God in ways that we've never connected with Him before. May we be so faithful in prayer that at the end of this, when life gets back to some kind of new normal, may prayer be at the center of that. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are with us every moment of every day. Thank you that you are with us in this season. Thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We pray that as we worship you, your spirit, your Holy Spirit would flow through and in each one of us. Help us to find your joy, to find your hope, to discover your patience, and to live faithfully in prayer with you. Father, we thank you for the many people who are serving you in such wonderful ways. May you continue to work in us and through us. Would you open our minds and our hearts that we might hear and receive your message in worship and through scripture. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us worship together.
our new sermon series, uh, we're just looking at some gospel figures who experienced resurrection life. And we want to read these accounts of these gospel figures uh, carefully, uh, so that we may gain a sense of what resurrection living is really all about. We want to reflect on those accounts in the light of our own living, uh, hoping and maybe even daring to believe that what was experienced by those people long ago may also be our experience today. And so Louise began the sermon series on resurrection living last week. And what a blessing, uh, as she just reflected about uh, being Easter people in a Good Friday world, uh, discovering our own resurrection moments when we face our places of death, when we feel with others, uh, when we work at not being numb uh, to human emotion, uh, when we listen out for the voice, when we follow the voice of God that calls us to take off our grave, grave clothes and to live. And so today we're going to be looking at a, a new uh, figure, a certain Nicodemus and the resurrection life that came to him. You may want to grab a Bible so that uh, you can have the text with you uh, over the next couple of moments. Nicodemus is mentioned in two places in the Gospel of John, at the beginning uh, in chapter 3 and also towards the end in chapter 19. And because of this, we have a kind of a time lapse uh, in his life. We get a now and then picture uh, of Nicodemus. Uh, we check in. Uh, on him three years after his initial meeting with Jesus. And so I'm going to read uh, the account of the first meeting of uh, Jesus, uh, the first meeting that he has with Jesus uh, that is recorded in John uh, chapter 3 in the first 21 verses uh, of that chapter. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, uh, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. He said, a Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Jesus said, you are Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the man who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, that experience eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they haven't believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. 
Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear of their deeds being exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I'm trusting that uh, God has a word for each one of us, a word to share from Nicodemus's life, uh, a word that will be resurrection life for us, a word that will resurrect our thinking uh, for our sake, for the sake of our own nation, for the sake of this world, uh, for the sake of God's church. So let's start by a noting uh, in verse uh, 10 to 13 that uh, Jesus goes about giving Nicodemus a reality check about his own spiritual state. Jesus confronts Nicodemus with the incongruency that is within his own being. That while he is a respected teacher, that while he is a respected leader of people, he himself is a poor learner. He has failed to master the basics. He displays a reluctance even to face the plain fact evidence and accept it. And so Jesus criticizes Nicodemus for his state of mind. He criticized Nicodemus for procrastinating on accepting the real truths and their demands on how he lives. He procrastinates by uh, always offering questions, by formulating questions, by using his brilliant mind to be clever, but not to be godly. Jesus then goes on to say that Nicodemus is not alone in this. And so in verse 19 to 21, we hear of Jesus saying that while God's light streams into this world, people opt rather for darkness. They display a disinterest in pleasing God and in rejecting the light. Denial and illusion and evil continues in these moments, and God realities captured in Jesus remain unnoticed or veiled by people. I think you and I have been uh, subjected to uh, those uh, leaders and teachers who, like Nicodemus, uh, have brilliant minds uh, but ungodly thoughts. Uh, the extreme Cases make the news. But the phenomenon is far wider than what media reports. Remember in my seven uh, years in the world of academia, I was amazed at the brilliance of many, but amazed by the godliness of only a few. Exposed to the egos, the agendas, the trampling over of those who wanted to climb the corporate ladder, the basic disregard for morality, sobering realities to be surrounded by. Sadly, this uh, pattern is not absent even in the, the ministry. And so my assumption is that our teachers and that our leaders in every sector of society will follow suit. As a result, I cannot but think that each one of us, that our nation, our world and that God's church are in need of the same reality check that was given to Nicodemus by Jesus. Our denial of truth, our readiness to live under illusion, our use of questions to evade answering the real questions, our use of questions to evade truth are all good reasons to expect Jesus to present us with a holy confrontation. A second con uh, consideration is that uh, maybe you and I need to confess just how closely we identify with Nicodemus in showing uh, some kind of curiosity in who Jesus is and what he represents. But it's not enough curiosity to be converted from our traditional beliefs from our thoughts, from our practices in any kind of significant way. Nicodemus shows that he's too firmly entrenched, too comfortable in his ways and in his worldview, 
too comfortable in the way that he thinks. And these things prevent him from grasping the reality that Jesus speaks of and that uh, Jesus uh, manifests or represents. This is an all too familiar and all too human response to Jesus. The central message of Easter is that evil is silenced. Uh, the central message of Easter is that sin is addressed. The central message of Easter is that suffering is absorbed. The central message of Easter is that death is defeated. Defeated by Jesus dying on a cross and being raised to life three days later. And these are extraordinary phrases. These are faith, faith statements that have very, very significant implications for life as we know it. The reality of the empty cross and the empty tomb, they have life-altering consequence. And yet too often, these claimed Jesus' realities get the same response that Nicodemus gave to Jesus. Curiosity is raised. A preliminary investigation may be offered, but like Nicodemus, we too are too firmly entrenched and comfortable with life as we know it, too comfortable with our own worldview, too set in our own ways, too stuck in our own thinking. We need a renewal of mind. To compare this uh, kind of response to the world's current response to the COVID-19 outbreak, just imagine if the COVID-19 pandemic raised our initial curiosity, but then we lost interest and we got bored, and we reverted to our normal way of thinking about this world. It would be catastrophic. Fortunately, we have seen a different response. I've been amazed at the interest, amazed at the energy, the commentary, amazed at the respect, the mindfulness and the resource that governments and their citizens have committed to the pandemic. I've watched worldwide media record its progress and its spread within nations and then from one nation to another. There's been a daily tally of stats, tracking the devastating suffering that is experienced by those who have contracted the virus. 245,000 people infected by the 19th of March. 461,000 six days later. 860,000 by the end of April. 2 million by mid-April and an expected 3 million plus, likely at the end of this month. Similarly, the deaths have been tracked. 10,000 by the 19th of March, 43,000 by the end of, uh, uh, of, April, uh, of, of March, uh, 143,000 by mid-April. And it looks like at the end of this month, over 200,000 people would have lost their life. Uh, to COVID-19. And so there's been this tracking, this telling of COVID-19's effect in this world. There's been coverage particularly of noisy nations' governments on what the plan is going forward. There's been commentary from the same noisy nations on what other governments uh, were either not doing uh, or were doing wrong. There's been the drawing together of the greatest minds in various areas of life to form a think tanks to plot the way forward. There's been a mind-staggering offer of resource into the various recovery plans or facets of their recovery plans that are being proposed around the world. Now, I'm not condemning the world's response to COVID-19 I'm not saying that the world in doing all of this has overreacted to the pandemic. I'm not wanting to trivialize our material existence and our body aliveness. 
But what needs to be pointed out is that if we can react like this to a disease that has and will continue to cause untold suffering and death, well then surely, surely our response to the one reality that is greater than the greater suffering, surely our response to the one reality that takes the sting out of death, Surely our response to the eternal God who raised Jesus from the dead, that response needs to be greater and not less than our response to the earthly reality of pandemics or any other earthly reality for that matter. And so although it's comfortable, uh, although it's uncomfortable, questions should always be raised when the following trends are found. When we spend 30 minutes every morning cramming our minds with the current pandemic developments in the world and yet spend no time considering the developments regarding the ways of God in this world. Our minds, we need to ask questions when our minds are drawn to all the stats and the plans to curb transmission and yet we discover that our minds have not considered God's plan for the restoration of this world. Questions need to be raised when we investigate the pandemic's impact on sport, on economics, on politics, but we don't give nearly as much energy to the eternal and to the unseen realities of God. Questions need to be raised when we are prepared to resource our response to the pandemic with whatever it takes. But then we are prepared to bargain with God for the least expensive way of supporting and realizing His work in this world. And so in short, if God is greater than any reality that this world offers, The question is, why do we choose to have ignorant and unformed minds for God? Why are we reluctant to apply the teachings of God in this world now? Why the disobedience? Why the allowances made for anti-God behavior? Anti-God realities? Why the continuation of self-centeredness? Why the accommodation of rudeness? Why the presence of assault and rage and withdrawal? Why the unlove? This leads to a third consideration in the Nicodemus story. That Jesus offers assistance to Nicodemus in his current spiritual state. And so in verse 14 to 17, Jesus offers some future event the lifting up of the Son of Man that will offer resurrection life experiences. This lifting up of the Son of Man event, it will be a powerful demonstration of God's love for this world so that there's an alternative other than destruction for people. Jesus explains to Nicodemus that this event is not so much about the pointing of a finger and telling the world how bad it is, but rather that its truest meaning is found in the Son of Man being lifted up to help the world to get right again, to offer this world salvation. At this point, we can finally turn to the account of Nicodemus three years later. Three years after this initial engagement with Jesus, And so in John 19, we are told that the Son of Man had been lifted up above people, that he now was lifeless on a cross. And upon instruction uh, to get rid of the dead bodies before the beginning of the Sabbath, a soldier came to pierce uh, Jesus' side just to check that he was truly dead. And then in John um, chapter 19, verse 38 to 42, we are told that uh, Nicodemus, uh, together with a friend, Joseph, who was also a member of the Sanhedrin, 
They go to the soldiers officiating at the crucifixion of Jesus and they present them with written permission to take the body of Jesus. And so the soldiers don't hesitate. After all, it is Pilate's order. And so they hand the body of Jesus over to them. And then they prepare the body and bury it. Now remember that it was the Sanhedrin that Nicodemus belonged to. It was the Sanhedrin that met to formulate the charge against Jesus that led to his arrest and to his death. Whether Nicodemus and Joseph were actually part of that meeting or whether they might have been absent, both were bound to the decisions of the meeting and were at least guilty by association of participating in the events that led to Jesus' death. And so this guilt must have weighed heavy on their shoulders. It must have come with a bundle of other emotions, of regret, of remorse, of shame, of disillusionment, of sorrow. It is at such times that uh, humans long for grace. When life goes so bad so quickly, when we are left with the stark realities of human failure and accompanying misery, we hold our breath, we dig deep, not sure that we have what it takes to get through the next couple of moments. We hope life will deal with us gently. We hope that we would experience some kind of unjustified mercy. We hope that our burden may be lighter rather than heavier. We hold our breath that our movement from our personal trials and difficulties will unfold favorably. For Joseph and for uh, Nicodemus, uh, as Pharisees, they would have been aware of the strong history of God offering grace in the face of brokenness and woundedness. Whether those wounds were self-induced or caused by others or as a result of circumstances beyond our own control. Whatever the brokenness, whatever the woundedness, Nicodemus knew from history, Nicodemus knew in his mind, he knew of a grace, he knew of an unjustified mercy, he knew of a favour that was offered by God for the healing of this world. And because God is God, what Nicodemus knew in his head and maybe even hoped for became his experience. No sooner had Jesus died on the cross than Joseph and Nicodemus are found uh, living with a new spirit. No longer are they living in a spirit of fear, of concealment. They are far bolder people. They are far riskier people. They are initiating and proactive people. The death of Jesus had transformed Nicodemus. It had done for Nicodemus what was not done while Jesus was still alive. Those who had been afraid when Jesus was alive, they were being transformed already by his death. Jesus had not been dead for even a day. And Jesus' own prophecy in John 12, verse 32, was coming true. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And so the power of the cross was at work. The power of the cross was already turning cowards into heroes, waverers into those who were making irrevocable decisions for Christ. Can we take some confidence in this truth for our broken and wounded selves? For our broken and wounded nation? For our broken and wounded church and world? God offers grace. God offers an unjustified mercy. God offers favor to the broken. And the power of the cross addresses the deficiencies. The power of the cross addresses the wounds that we find in ourselves. And in those places where we have messed up, 
In those places where we are filled with regret and remorse, sorrow, guilt and shame, there's a power from the cross that gives us a new spirit to live by. When we are broken and when we are tender from the trials and from the difficulties of life, when we are filled with sorrow at the loss of life, we can expect God's grace and God's favour. It was true for Joseph and Nicodemus. It was true for the other disciples. And this truth has been experienced by every follower of Jesus Christ uh, since the first Easter. And so may you know something of God's grace. May you know something of God's unjustified mercy. May you know, may, may you know something of God's favour right in the midst of this season of living under the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for resurrection life to come to our minds, for a renewal, a transformation of the way that you and I think, of the way that our teachers and leaders think, in the way that our nation, our world and our church think. May we be transformed by resurrection power. Amen. Thank you.